and welcome to Conversations with Dr. Stephen Greer. I'm Dr. Greer and founder of SeriousDisclosure.com and uh, the Disclosure Project. And I'd like to thank the folks at the World Puja Network for hosting us here every two weeks to bring you information and news about what we're doing on uh, the world of disclosure, uh, free energy, and contact with extraterrestrial intelligence. And really excited about what we're going to be talking about today. I have a, a wonderful gentleman uh, here who has done so much work on the uh, serious Facebook page, which is Serious the Movie, uh, on Facebook, and his name is Matt Humphrey. He's a, a volunteer who's been helping, who's done enormous amounts of work for us, uh, and for which I, we are very grateful. And uh, his interest in all this is to really to help clean up the planet and to make the world a better place for us to live, and uh, he sees disclosure as an important part of that. And he uh, has a background in marketing uh, and consulted in, in holistic and botanical medicines and health foods and environmental products and uh, music. And he's uh, really a pure-hearted, wonderful person who stepped up to the plate when we needed the help. And I think uh, you know we formed that uh, Facebook page, and now it has something like uh, 40 or 50,000 people following on it. So it's very good. So thank you very much, Matt Humphreys, and welcome to the show. Thank you, Dr. Greer, and uh, it's a pleasure to be on here with you. Um, and, uh, uh, well, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, so one of the things I wanted to do is bring some people up to date with some, some news of what's happening. And uh, as um, many of you know, we're just finally getting the uh, DVD master completed, and it's at the manufacturing facility. So in the next uh, week or two, that's gonna, it's going to be manufactured and then begin to be shipped out. So those of you who have uh, patiently, and we thank you, uh, been waiting for your DVD of the film, Sirius, uh, that is going to be uh, coming out very soon to all of you. And uh, everyone who uh, contributed um, to the film uh, series during the crowdfunding effort uh, who, had, who had given uh, a certain amount will be getting a, a complimentary one. Those of you who want to order them can go to SeriousDisclosure.com and you can both see the film there on video on demand uh, and also you can order a copy of the DVD uh, which will be available worldwide and begin shipping uh, within the next couple of weeks. So we're very excited that that's uh, being done and it, it pretty much wraps up uh, the, the initial production uh, of the film and uh, we're uh, really grateful to everyone who's worked so hard on this to get it to this point and all of you who, who contributed because you know there's something like 4,000 people who have contributed to this film to make it the most successful crowdfunded documentary in history and it's just uh, going around the world now it's been out for now for a little over a month or a month and a half and uh, it's been very exciting to see uh, how much interest there is in uh, this film so thank you all of you for your support uh, the other thing I want to, to say is that we're uh, putting up on our website um, a page that describes what we're doing for uh, funding the New Energy Research Lab for STAR, a serious technology and research, um, and that is going to have the budget and our goals and objectives, and so you can go to seriesdisclosure.com and see what kind of progress we're making with the fundraising and uh, what our plans are for a two-year period to do the research and development on the zero-point energy systems and other uh, innovative technologies that would get us off oil, gas, and coal. So that uh, is up on our site, and uh, we're very excited that uh, we'll be able to continue with that campaign, and we're, we're hoping the public and perhaps some larger investors as well may come forward to, to help us realize that dream because it's desperately needed. Uh, I also just wanted to make a, a, a note that I know many people have been asking about our expedition to um, England, to the crop circles in uh, late July and early August that is um, full and it's got a waiting list so unfortunately uh, there, there's no more spaces on that. Uh, we will be having uh, or planning to put together a uh, expedition for the Close Encounters of the Fifth Kind initiative that will be in the western United States this fall and we're still looking the way it looks like we may have found a really fantastic retreat center that's surrounded by national forests that we can all stay at together and, and have a really great meditative retreat experience. We're still getting the details of that worked out, but as soon as we have them, we'll let all of you know. And if you want to sign up for our 
uh, newsletter that comes out every week or so, you can go to seriousdisclosure.com and just sign up, and it's free to do so. There's no membership charge or anything like that. So, um, so anyway, so I know what we're planning to do today. Matt has been working with uh, the Facebook crowd and has a whole series of questions that are coming in frequently to that page. And uh, what he's going to do is sort of represent those who have had the questions and present them to me so we can have a discussion about what all of you have been asking about. So, Matt, do you want to begin with that? Okay, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, yesterday I put out there uh, uh, just, a, just a statement that Dr. Greer would like to talk about Sirius the Movie Facebook page and just does anybody have any questions. And we got quite an overwhelming response, um, about 75 different questions. Oh, boy. Um, <laughs> we'll get through a few of them. Yeah, I think there's only time to deal with a couple of them. So, um, But one thing that seems to be on a lot of people's mind is uh, what, what do you think we should do, um, how do you think we should deal with if the governments create a false flag uh, operation or invasion, um, one that includes uh, violence and fear? Well, you know what's interesting when I'm asked that question, I, what I immediately go to, which shocks people, is that they've already done it. And I know there's a, a pregnant pause there, but for about 50 years, the classified programs dealing with UFOs and extraterrestrial intelligence has been feeding into the public an enormous amount of disinformation that's tailor-made to create fear and uh, hatred of, of extraterrestrial civilizations. And this information has come out in a number of ways. The number one way is through the UFO subculture. The, number, the secondary way is through the Hollywood film industry and also through cable television series. So if you look at this subject and just step back, you'll see that about 80 to 90 percent of the material out there uh, is framed in a very dualistic way of us versus them, and there are good ETs and bad ETs, and they've invaded, and they're taking people and doing horrible things to them, and on and on and on and on. It turns out that that was a plan that was concocted back in the 50s, uh, and there's a CIA document that's I know we have a lot of material on our website, but it's uh, from 1953, where the CIA talks about uh, using the subject for, and I'm quoting from this document, psychological warfare value and purposes. Uh, then you, you find that there's a Strategic Studies Institute document from the 90s uh, that talks specifically about creating a global fear around the alien issue by using what's called stagecraft to stage certain abduction scenarios and other frightening scenarios using advanced aerospace anti-gravity vehicles and other modalities to hoax events. And this shocks most people. So people have had real contact, and then there's other stuff that's gone on. I remember a number of years ago I was interviewing an Army Ranger who I could not get to come out on publicly for the Disclosure Project who was on a squad that was part of one of these abduction squads going around abducting people, making it look like it was an ET encounter when it wasn't. Now, this is not to say that everyone who's had an encounter with an ET or UFO is, has been targeted by a covert military program, but a lot have. And it's gotten mixed in with the real cases. And so what you find is that it's sort of like if you had some golden nuggets and a mountain of fool's gold and someone just dumped on the real contact events that people have had a whole mountain of other cases that had been designed to deceive people. And that is the problem that you have in, 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 in on the Internet and on this subject. And it's been actually a very effective program because I remember years ago when my children were little giving a talk at an elementary school and I was talking about what we were doing and going out and making contact and all the great experiences we'd had. And one of the little children, I, I think this was uh, maybe six or seven year old said, but aren't you afraid, Dr. Greer, that they're going to come and abduct you and torture you and do terrible things to you? And this was a little child. <laughs> so you, what you find is that this has found its way into the subculture so well. Now, why is that important? Because, and, and you can look at the history of World War II, and for that matter, the Cold War and the war on terrorism to, to, to analyze this. 
you really can't get the public to support any kind of scenario, if it's false flag or what have you, without having first demonized an enemy. So uh, certainly that's what Adolf Hitler did in sort of demonizing the Jewish population and gay people and the Roma, so-called Roma, the gypsies and others. And this has been done all through the Cold War and propaganda efforts. And it was done, of course, in, in other scenarios. The Gulf of Tonkin incident is a famous case, of course, where they hoaxed and staged an attack uh, on our own Navy vessels to expand the Vietnam War um, because uh, there was growing consensus that we should just not go into that misadventure. And, and, and uh, the military-industrial complex and the warmongers and profiteers wanted us to expand that uh, operation. So this kind of manipulation goes on all the time. Um, I know some people say that's a rather cynical view. It isn't a cynical view. It's a historic and accurate view. And for that reason, uh, the, what I've always said to folks is knowledge is the greatest purifier. Gr wonderful quote from the Vedas. And if you know that something is being staged and there is stagecraft and that there are advanced anti-gravity devices made by Lockheed Martin and Northrop Grumman and other companies that can hoax an event, knowing that is halfway to not being tricked by it. So, so again, knowledge is very important because in the vacuum of that, and this is what you find in the UFO subculture, a lot of people don't realize that what our capabilities are. So they think anything that goes bump in the night that's unusual has to be extraterrestrial because they haven't studied what the capabilities are within the really high-end contracting world in the aerospace industry and in the intelligence community and, importantly, counterintelligence and uh, this sort of, of, of creating uh, – sowing the seeds for a false flag operation. And, of course, this was one of the things that Werner von Braun on his deathbed was very concerned about, is that he knew, knew personally about uh, plans to eventually, after he said the Cold War and after global terrorism. And, by the way, our testimony from, from Carol Rosen on that came before 9-11 was acquired before 9-11. But then after that, they would play this card of an, a threat from outer space, like Ronald Reagan said at the UN, where wouldn't it be easier to unite the world if we had a common alien threat to unite against? And I always thought when I heard that, I said, how sad that people think the only way we can unite each other is to create a bigger enemy in space. This is not going forward. This is taking 10 steps backward because we're trading international conflict and ethnic conflict for interplanetary conflict, which is not only insane, but and not survivable, uh, but a complete hoax. And so, but knowing about it and exposing that hoax is really, really important. Now, that I was told back years ago by a man who wrote a, something called the Controllers, a Martin Cannon, who had discovered a lot of these false flag operations that had been going on for decades in the UFO subculture. Uh, and he told me personally, he says, if you begin to expose this part of the agenda, they will do everything to marginalize you and defame you and attack you. And the counterintelligence community will stand up everything they can because this is part of their long-term plan. And that's what Carol Rosen talked about, as did Werner Von Braun, that there was this plan to be able to move from – a global superpower conflicts and then global terrorism issues to some larger existential threat uh, that's out in space. And, and, of course, that way you can grow the military-industrial complex from a trillion a year to two or three or four trillion a year globally. Um, and it's a little bit like the, the movie Independence Day, you know, where they go, you know, let's kick alien butt, you know, and it's like this whole let's unite the world in fighting these marauding. And that's, of course, the stock and trade of, of 90 percent of Hollywood movies on this subject, as well as, unfortunately, most documentaries on this subject, which is why we wanted to do something different with, with the film Sirius. Um, I don't think people really understand, Matt, how deep the – capabilities are. Many people will see some of the things that have happened. They'll say, oh, well, humans couldn't have done that, could they? The answer is yes. I mean, you know, if you whatever you've heard about uh, in terms of really high-tech military warfare in uh, electronics and aircraft, there are gen things that are g 20 generations more advanced that are in these uh, 
so-called unacknowledged special access projects or super black projects. And have they been used to create scenarios that confuse people and scare people? Yes. So in a sense, we're already living in that period of what I call the preparatory phase. And for the most part, the public have bought that hook, line, and singer. A sinker. And, and that's the unfortunate part. I think all we can do is say, look, before everyone starts running Chicken Little style, oh, my God, the sky is falling, people need to stop and look at what the agenda would be. Who benefits from this kind of us versus them duality? Uh, and is that really the future we want? Do we want to go from conflicts amongst people and ethnic groups and races and national groups and economic philosophies and what have you into interplanetary conflict. Uh, I think most sane people would say no. But if people can be manipulated in their beliefs and their perspectives and their prejudices, then it makes it easy to then do something that would be a false flag event because they've already prepared people uh, like this little child that asked that question to be uh, predisposed towards thinking there's a threat out there and that, oh, yes, we need to um, come together as a people to resist that. Um, now, of course, you know, when this was asked to me by a, fo a man at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base some years ago, there was a colonel, um, Canola, who um, was <laughs> – the, the sort of very senior at the Foreign Aerospace Science and Technology Center, which is uh, was the had been the Foreign Technology Division of the Air Force that had received the Roswell crash remains. And when I was sitting out there at this meeting, uh, a meeting he did not want to have, he was ordered to have it with us by the the head of uh, Air Force Intelligence, uh, who was ordered by the head of Intelligence Joint Staff to make it happen. And he, he, he turned to me, he says, well, what if some of these civilizations are hostile? And I said, well, let's think about this for a minute. You're talking about civilizations that have the ability to go faster than the speed of light and travel amongst star systems. Their technologies would be in the hundreds of thousands to millions of years more advanced than ours. If they were hostile, we wouldn't be sitting in this room breathing the free air of Earth. It would have all been over about the time we detonated the first atomic bomb at the Trinity site. I said, the fact that they have not engaged in that kind of event, it kind of shows the kind of restraint they, they obviously have because we have been firing at them periodically and occasionally hitting them. So uh, I think that, you know, the, the kind of fear that is out there and I, if there's – you know, there's all kinds of phobias out there. You know, there's there's racism and anti-Semitism and homophobia, and you can add to this now exophobia, the fear and hatred of, of, of extraterrestrials. This is sort of the thing that is not useful, but I think that if you were looking at it from a strategist's point of view of how do we – uh, control large numbers of people on a subject that they don't really control. They don't really control what the ETs are doing and how they're coming and going. They know that they can control psychologically the masses through fear engendering events, which is exactly you know uh, the kinds of things that have happened in other false flag operations. So I think the only way to to, to handle that is to discuss it, um, put it out there, and uh, you know, this Strategic Studies Institute document is up. Uh, we have it. Uh, uh, you know, this is something that other people uh, – before I got involved in this subject, Matt, there were folks who, were, who, who had done very extensive research into the hoaxing and staging of frightening uh, pseudo-encounter events. Uh, but no one wants to hear that because everyone likes to have someone to hate. And so it, it's, it's unfortunate that that's a part of human nature that has this sort of tribalistic aspect where we're wanting to find something other than us that we feel superior to that we can hate and then engage in warfare. Um, and this has been the organizing principle for humans for many, many thousands of years. And I think what we have to do is say, isn't it time for us to find a different way of living? that isn't based on someone other than us that we have to be afraid of and hate and engage in violent conflict with. With the kind of technology we're talking about, which are much more sophisticated weapons, say what are called scalar 
and, and other type of weapons than the weapons that are, are, are say, thermonuclear and atomic weapons. Uh, with that kind of technology, you're talking about a non-survivable event if there was a conflict, because even with nuclear weapons, it was called mutual assured destruction. And, you know, Carl Sagan used to talk about the nuclear winter, and it'd be just the end of life as we know it if we had had a full-out conflict with the Soviet Union. Do people really think that we're going to go Star Wars style out in space and have uh, interplanetary conflict? Well, this is silly because people who think that have looked at too much science fiction and haven't thought about what the consequences of these kinds of technologies that are, have been weaponized, and they are weaponized in classified projects, um, would do if there was a, 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 this kind of – uh, engagement with a threat from outer space, as Ronald Reagan called it. Mm-hmm. So uh, this is this is a really deep issue. I mean, you know, at some point you could, one could do an entire book on this. Uh, a few people beat me to the punch on the other side of the the, the discussion, and I know uh, a couple years ago there were some Lockheed Martin scientists who talked about how we should never uh, we shouldn't try to make any contact with extraterrestrials because it's likely that they will uh, want to engage in a hostile conflict, but we need to be preparing now for that conflict. And of course, these were people who were tied into the aerospace industry, which would receive the contracts for the multi-trillion dollar uh, (laughs) build-up. The reality is that the opposite is really closer to the truth, that um, at least it's my understanding that, that most of the what we would consider to be more real contacts have been very benevolent and uh um the well, been benevolent yes they've been benevolent they've been scientific or they've been wanting to uh, have us understand them and, and and have them understand us better and i always say you know part of this is an anthropocentric projection and what i mean by that is um people project onto something that is really says more about themselves than what they're discussing and I think that you know the, the one of the great uh, sayings in, in, in the Vedas it's more on the World Puja Network I like referencing the, the Bhagavad Gita and the Vedas a lot is that the world is as you are and if if you are about fear and insecurity and hatred you're going to project that out there onto others and and in this case since you're dealing with something that is really different, different from another race or another uh, continent or another people or economic system. You're talking about civilizations from another planet. Um, It's very ripe for exploiting if you want to exploit that part of, of human nature to be afraid of the unknown or to be afraid of the otherness. Uh, which, of course, is the roots of, of racism and all the other isms. But I think what we have to think is, okay, over this past hundred years, what have we learned? Um, have we learned the lessons of the Jim Crow era and the Cold War and the Holocaust and these other horrific things that humans have done to each other? And for all the fear-mongering that goes on on the ET issue, I always point out, look, let's not get carried away here with that. Uh, we can show that 200 million people have been killed on planet Earth through warfare at our own hands in the last century alone, never mind through recorded history. So we've become a sort of an existential threat to ourselves, and this is an existential threat to ourselves. But then the question becomes very quickly, are we being viewed as a not only a threat to ourselves, but a threat to others? And if we start going into space with very advanced systems that are way beyond the space shuttle, with the consciousness of otherness as opposed to cosmic consciousness and oneness, we are a, a very risky group of people at that point. So I think you know when I've heard these stories from so many of the disclosure project witnesses who are at nuclear facilities and strategic air command and um, nuclear weapons processing facilities where there were these ET craft that came over and were checking out what we were doing. Many witnesses who who, uh, uh, recount uh, the the ETs watching what we were doing with the space program. Why would they be concerned with that? Well, because they saw that we went from, in a couple generations, from horse and buggies all right, when my dad was around in the early 1900s, to thermonuclear weapons and early space travel. Well, this is a very a worrisome trajectory by any dispassionate observer, I think. Yes. Um, so 
So um, should we move on to to another question? Or Sure. Oh, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, but that, those are my thoughts on that. Okay. Um, uh, a lot of a lot of users, a lot of people that are on the Facebook page um, would like to know if you're if you have any plans to make another documentary or a video that might be focusing specifically on the on the CE fives. Yes, in fact, you know, uh, as, as those of you who want to go and see the film Sirius, um, you can see it online now, and, and you get the DVD. And we hope to have more in, more theaters showing it soon. Um, and it, the film Sirius goes into the whole concepts of close encounters of the fifth kind, which is when people using the protocols we've developed uh, that involve very Vedic concepts of consciousness and remote viewing. Um, make contact and invite contact with these interstellar civilizations without prejudice. In other words, we're not saying this race can come and that. We're not, in, we're not engaging in interstellar racism when we do this. It's a very ambassador uh, conscious and non-dualistic framework, which is that's the hardest part for people to get through, uh, first of all. Um, and, but once people get to that point and they realize that these protocols really do work, and on our website you can go to um, seriousdisclosure.com and there are Android and iPhone apps where you, the entire meditation procedure, remote view program, um, the tones that we project out into space are all in this app. It's a very large app. It's like, I don't know, 50 megabytes or something. But you know that you can get and begin to practice this. And there are now thousands and thousands of people around the world doing it. And one of the things that I would like to be able to do at some point would be at least maybe a, a 45 minute to hour a documentary only on that, you know. And, and it is something that we we want to do. I mean, in my spare time, but um, because I think people need a, a more intensive uh, training uh, that would that would be involved in. in a, a, a really just exclusive treatment on that subject, and it is something we do plan to do. Although, uh, you know, it, it may not be until later this year or next year, just because of the time schedule and and my schedule. The rate limiting thing on all this is time, um, and and of course resources. But it, it's more more a time issue. But that is something we are planning. It is actually on the drawing board, and um, we're we're outlining it. And I want to point out that there's an enormous amount of photographic and audio evidence and experiences that we've we've had over the years, uh, some of which are outlined in the book um, uh, Extraterrestrial Contact, Countdown to Transformation, that you can get on our website um, that, that comes with a DVD that also shows a lot of the really amazing and cool things that have happened. But I'd like to if you, it would be wonderful to put that into a instructional documentary just on that, and that is something we are planning to do. Um, my own view of it is that if I, if we have time to do it in the next year or so, is to do an entire course that would involve. Uh, when we go out for a week, such as we are in England, um, where the sessions would be recorded and edited into certain specific um, modalities. So it probably would be more like a, a, a 10 or 20 part series that would go very in depth into meditation, remote viewing, the contact protocols, the kinds of phenomenon that we experience that range from craft appearing to electronic tones emerging out of trans-dimensional space-time to fully materialized objects uh, that are near us or uh, trans-dimensional beings that are ETs that are floating outside the circle that you can see as sort of an energy field that uh, when you have digitally photograph them uh, show up like the photograph that's on the website on the CSETI site. So these are all things that would be great to have in a uh, not only just a documentary but then uh, an entire uh, course uh, that would be on videotape that we could make available and that that is something I do want to do in the next year or so because I think so many people would, would enjoy that. A lot of people can't get free to go on these week-long expeditions all over the world but that's something that we've never done. Now we have someone on our team who's a videographer and a budding filmmaker who, by the way, uh, just did this amazing, uh, I guess it's about 14-minute uh, video 
on the Atacama humanoid that you can, uh, if you go to seriousdisclosure.com, there's a there's a link to it, uh, and it's it's free for anyone to see. It, it goes to a, a Serious Disclosure YouTube channel that uh, has this really great uh, summary that he put together from all the evidence we have so far on this this little tiny six inch. Yes, I think he did a great job on that little film, and it also helps to answer some of the the unanswered questions that are out there about the Atacama human humanoid. Yeah, have you seen it, Matt? Did you get the yes. answer? Yeah. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. yeah, I think he did a great job, and I think you know Zan uh, Gillies did a, w a wonderful job, and so we're hoping that that we can do something on the. Uh, CE5 initiative. We're planning in the next few weeks to do something just on what we want to do with the Ener Energy Research Lab uh, that would also go up like that, that would go through a lot of what our plans are, what the issues are, what the strategy is. Yep, a lot of people have questions about that as well. Oh, do they? Okay. Well, that's great. Um, just, you know, where where are the funds going and how, uh, how what type of progress is, you know, being made towards the energy lab, et cetera, et cetera. Well, I mean, of course, the, we're in the very early stages of, of uh, any uh, any fundraising, but you know, there's a couple of hundred thousand dollars that's been raised, which is good. Um, the, the the budget that is up on the website as of the when folks are hearing this recording is a six point three million dollar two year budget. Now, one of the things I want to explain there, a lot of people have asked, well, you know, why don't you start something before you reach that goal? And I said, well, we've already done that. Uh, and people, you know, people are a little confused by that. For the last, uh, I guess, 14 years, uh, w we spent a few hundred thousand dollars going all over the world investigating claims of people who had these sort of devices. Most of them turned out not to be what they were advertising, frankly. Um, then we were providing some grants to people who had ideas who seem to have good concepts, but they were never able to do it by themselves in their spare time in their basements and workshops, uh, even if it was a substantial grant that we provided. Uh, then the folks who had the technologies or uh, were, we, were on the path to would, would then get threatened or get a knock on the door. Uh, and this happened uh, in, the, in the not so distant past. What we concluded from this experience, and it's a lot of uh, frustrating uh, encounters where we literally went all over the world investigating this, is that there's a lot of great folks out there who, if they were brought together in a synergistic way, could do something. But when people are lone wolves trying to do this, they either can't do it or if they get close to doing it, they're then intimidated and it gets taken out. Um, and so that model... Uh, which we knew at the time was unlikely to succeed, but that's all the funding we had, we tried. So a lot of people have suggested, why don't you do that? Well, we've done that, and it was done very thoroughly. Uh, and so my conclusion from doing this for about 14 years is that it needs to be – one of two things has to happen – either someone has something that they're willing to come forward with that is not a black box – and what do I mean by a black box? It's, it's sort of like the problem that Rossi is having in Italy where he has this potential cold fusion system, but nobody knows what's going on inside the system. And so since no one can reproduce it independently, of course, people are going to say, well, we don't know if it's a legitimate uh, scientifically reproducible effect or not. Uh, and ultimately, the sine qua non of science is, independent scientific reproducibility. And what we have found is that a lot of people won't cooperate with that because they become so paranoid and, I, I, in a sense, worried that someone's going to steal their idea that they won't do it. And uh, one a famous case that happened that came to us two different ways was a person out in the Midwest that had one of these devices, and it sounded quite legitimate. But basically, he wanted to do a black box demonstration where we could not know anything of what was inside the box. But and, and that, to, but to even get to that stage, he wanted us to wire uh, ten million dollars into a Swiss bank account. Well, I don't have ten million dollars, and neither I don't think Matt has ten million dollars. And even if you found a billionaire, they wouldn't do it because it's just so crazy. So what you find with some of these folks is that. Even if they have something, and this was, of course, the Achilles heel for, for Stan Meyer, who did have an over-unity electrolysis system that would break water into hydrogen and oxygen. 
And we did investigate that, and it did happen. Unfortunately, the patents that he put out there deliberately put in the wrong voltages and, and uh, cycles per second resonance uh, for the electronics to dissociate the water into um, so-called Brown's gas, or what he called it, you know, this uh, H2O uh, that is the hydrogen and oxygen into a gaseous mixture that's actually magnetically charged and that will then be able to be used in a combustion engine. And it takes very little power to do it if you have the right sweet spot in the electronic coils that dissociate the water and into hydrogen and oxygen. But he, he deliberately put the wrong information in the patents, which is why no one's – and then he, he died suddenly. And his twin brother is, was so intimidated by how he died, which was very suspicious, that he doesn't want to step into this. For, for fear of, of, of reprisals or something bad happening to him. So I think that the way we need to do this is to put together a laboratory that has basically what we're doing streaming on the Internet and that is done as open source as humanly possible so that the public is involved and knows because secrecy doesn't work. And this is what I've been trying to say to inventors for years. Um, the, the sort of the inventor syndrome where they want to become very secretive doesn't work. So what we're proposing to do is to raise what in research and development world is a very small amount of funding, $6.3 million, to have a lab that's staffed with around 18 people initially of engineers, physicists, machinists, electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, material specialists who know what specialized materials, and then customized high-voltage correction, very high-voltage analyzers so that you can create signals that are in the tens of thousands to millions of volts, but at very low current, where you begin to hit a resonant frequency in, whether it's in water or crystalline material or nanocrystalline material or coils that result in this zero-point energy access uh, vector that gets created in space-time. And, and that's, that we, we understand the principles. We have a lot of information on how to do it. Um, it is a serious physics and engineering uh, pr process to do that. And, um, you know, I, I, I tweeted the other day kind of tongue-in-cheek that if we had 10% of what the IRS spends on its frivolous parties, we could do this. Um, <laughs> and so so our goal is, is to do it that way because the other ways that people have suggested doing it, we've actually already done. Well, and then the transparency aspect of it provides a certain safety net as well. Well, that's actually why why we we did disclosure the way we did. I mean, we we were collecting information, witnesses, materials uh, for a number of years, and it all came out at that National Press Club event 12 years ago. And you squeeze the toothpaste out of the tube in such a way that it can't be put back in. Um, moreover, you have thousands, millions of people watching it. You know, and at that time, that was the most watched event in the history of the internet at the time not just at the National Press Club, but in the world. Wow. And so, yes, and that is a statistical true statement. So if we do this with the energy research project, we need to do that the same way. And and when there is something where we do hit that sweet spot and there is a, I don't care if it's 100 watts of, quote, free energy that is reproducible and provable, that goes viral. And it gets reproduced at multiple places. We've already lined up in universities who are people willing to do it. And the public knows it. But it, it needs to be done in a, in a way that can be – it can't be a black box. Because even though I know 99.999% of inventors who work on things, oh, I put all my life's work into this and I want to get something for it. But the truth is with 7 billion people on the planet, any group that would be the first out of the gate with something like this um, – there are so many opportunities for energy generation that would create the funding needs that any inventor would ever need. Uh, so, it, you know, this sort of secretive, keep it, you know, the, the mindset of Silicon Valley with the next iPhone or the next uh, video app or the next uh, whatever, where everything is so secretive and, you know, you have a bond and you sign your life away because you're working on some tchotchke that's really just a piece of junk made in a Chinese slave factory. I mean, when you're talking about the Apple products, uh, uh, you know, there's all this nonsense that goes into that and that, that mindset 
will work for an app or a software program. It will not work for a technology that the national security, well, the super national security state that's actually transnational, not just in the you know, U.S., but, you know, Russian scientists who tried to do this, British scientists, uh, have all run into this buzzsaw where horrific things have happened. It can't be done in that secretive way. And so the secrecy is your enemy, whereas doing it in a very open way is your friend and uh, is your protector. And the public will be your Guardians is how I look at it. I mean, in, in the sense that um, the, the, the covert programs do not want to step into, I mean, they have their own buzz saws up, but they don't want to step into the buzz saw of millions of people seeing overtly some goons going in with a national security order seizing something that would get us off fossil fuels and keep the world from going belly up environmentally, et cetera. So I think at a certain point you have to understand that the strategy – and it is what's key. And you have to then back up your plans and your funding and how you're going to do it based on the strategy, which has been built on the study of the last hundred years of these types of devices all the way back to Tesla and before and how they were suppressed, how they were bought up and black shelved. And this becomes another problem. A lot of people say, oh, aren't there wealthy people who will just fund this? I say, yeah, well, you would think that's the case. And in reality, there aren't, um, because when they begin to drill into it, they're afraid if they're the primary funder, something bad will happen to them or their family. Well, how do I know this? Because I've, I've met with many of them. Uh, and, and I think so the public has to say, well, if we want to do it, let's do it. Now, you know, we have 80-some thousand people on our mailing list. If everyone on that list every month uh, basically clicked the donate button and gave $10, which is the price of a deli sandwich, uh, in a few months, we'd have that budget. That's it may, it is true. And, 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 and what I have said to people, if the public doesn't want to support it, I don't want to hear people complain about it's not out there. Because you're not going to do a serious physics research and development program like this for nothing. And if you do it in an undercapitalized way where someone's trying to do this in their spare time out on their farm – you're setting yourself up for what we've already gone through in the last 10 years, and, and that is some very fruitless and dangerous experiences. So having learned from that, what I've concluded is that this is how it needs to be done. Now, let's say if we don't reach that point, then I think what we have to do is continue to provide the educational inf the information and the educational materials and uh, programs so that more and more and more people in the world get educated on the subject so we do reach that target. So that's what we would do if we don't, you know, if, if the funds don't reach the point. Uh, because you really can't ask someone who's in a professional career track to leave their job when you only have two months of funding in the bank or a month of funding in the bank. No one's going to do that. Um, so the reality is if you're going to do this, Let's be serious about it, uh, you know, pun in, intended, and, and do it in a way that is professional and that also strategically is safe and secure uh, and that has learned from the mistakes of folks like Tesla and Dirac and T. Henry Moray and Stan Meyer and the experience of our own team with the Orion Project over the last decade. Um, you, you, if you don't learn from these experiences, you're going to repeat them. And so that's what we're trying to bring to this strategically. And um, so that's what it would be uh, positioned to do. Now, I don't know if the public and or and or some uh, people who have uh, higher net worths who could contribute more funds to this effort would will step up to the plate and do it. All we can do is articulate our plan and put it out there and see if there's support for it. Um, and if there is, we can go forward. If not, we'll continue to work this uh, every way we can. Uh, and so that's what we're trying to do. And it's, I, I would say to people who are asking about it, it's really more up to everyone listening. Because everyone with social media and Facebook and Twitter can network this information to everyone they know. And if a lot of people provided a little bit of support, we'd be there. Well, yeah, and then um – once again, the, the whole issue of not having the money come from one source, which could, um, you know, be squelched or could be, you know, a vehicle for squelching the whole program if it was, you know, all in, all the eggs in one basket. But, um, 
you know, um, we really appreciate all the support that um, that uh, any any viewer of the movie or anybody out there wants to contribute. It's easy to do that. Just go to SeriousDisclosure.com. We have a donation page there. Well, and the other thing is that if someone does have an operational device, uh, and, and I don't rule out that there could be someone out there, we're very happy to look into that if they can be rational. We're not interested in someone sending us a videotape of saying, see, this works, now send me $500,000 so I can do more work on it. Well, that, that happened this week. Um, so that's not going to happen. So let's, okay, get out of crazy town for a nanosecond and talk real world. What we need to have is the ability to, if someone has something, that they would cooperate with transparent testing by independent people and independent reproduction of the system to show that it is reproducible and there's not some trick going on. And the reason that's so important is that I'll give you one example. A few years ago, there was someone who had a, a black box. It was a circuit that was encased in resin, plastic. And they claimed that if you put this in the the power supply to any motor, it reduced by 50% the amount of energy it would use because it was pulling energy out of out of the uh, infinite field of energy and et cetera. So we said, oh, that's really cool. And in fact, the Southwest Research Institute had uh, done a test on it and said, yeah, it is. So we took this, did an MRI, because we couldn't take it apart, and we found out that it had a circuit that was changing the power phase angle and tricking the meters. It was using the same amount of power but the meter was being alternated by a feedback loop that changed what's called the power phase angle. And electrical engineers will know what I'm talking about. And it was a total scam. <laughs> so, you know, now it took us months. And Dr. Eugene Malov and some of the most brilliant people, and God rest his soul, he, he was murdered a few years ago, got to the bottom of it. But so we have to have something where we don't have to spend six months and a hundred thousand dollars to see what's going on because there could be some little trick in there, right? Right. I don't know if, if that's too much to ask for. I would tell people, please don't contact us because we've been down that path for ten or twelve years. We've spent untold hours, traveled all over the world, hundreds of thousands of dollars to go through one experience like that after another. So, in a sense, I'm just going to be really. Let's be honest. If someone has something legitimate, it needs to be able to be transparently tested. If not by us, who? DARPA, the Department of Energy, it ain't going to happen. So we will do that. But it ha there, there are certain criteria that have to be met, and they're reasonable criteria. Because if we can't transparently see what's going on in there instead of a black box, we're not interested in even hearing about it at this stage because we've been down that path a dozen times. Secondly, it has to be reproducible. So if you can't have an independent person, if they want to do a non-disclosure agreement, they can reproduce it. And if it's a, not a reproducible science, it's not a real science. This is the sine qua non of science. So I think that those are reasonable expectations. Um, and let's get to the punchline. If you're really wanting this to get out to the public, to 7 billion people who desperately need it, it's eventually going to have to go to massive manufacturing where a lot of people are going to know what's in there. And the first thousand people who buy it are going to be people who are going to take it apart, reverse engineer it, and come out with a better mousetrap. So this whole secret to paranoia stuff is, dare I say, nonsense. And we really don't have time to waste on nonsense at this point. Um, the world is in an emergency. We're in, in a geopolitical and environmental emergency and an existential threat to the survival of our species and, and to our planet going forward. So we need to, to be mature and thoughtful about this, and that's all we're asking anyone who would approach us with an existing device that they cooperate in that way. And if they don't want to and they have a different philosophy about patenting and secrecy, that's fine, but that's, they, they should go to someone else and not to us. And so hopefully this, all of these efforts can help move us in the, in the direction opposite from our addiction to oil. Right. I mean, that's the goal. The goal is, well, there's several goals. We have to, first of all, understand and map out in our minds 
where do we want to be in a year, five years, ten years, a hundred years, a thousand years? Um, you know, as the Chinese saying goes, unless we change directions, we're likely to end up where we're going. And we're headed towards a really terminal, dreadful uh, event uh, if we stay on the path we're on. So we need a pretty dramatic course correction. And it's getting pretty late in the game, in my opinion, to do it. It should have happened 100 years ago when Tesla and others started coming out with this information. We certainly should have world peace and on top of that universal peace we need to bring out these technologies that are used for peaceful and not weaponized purposes and we need to come together as a people and decide to do that and the 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 consciousness of you know what i call the people of hate who are always trying to figure out someone new to hate that we also have to leave behind you know because if you look at the last hundred years you know well it was either I grew up in the South in the Jim Crow era in the 50s, 60s, and, and, you know, it was either black people or there was misogyny or it's this race or this creed or that religion or gay people or this person or that. There's always someone new to hate. And now, of course, the new, as I said, exophobia, the new thing that people like to get together and be afraid of are the ETs. But so that whole consciousness of division uh, precludes the future. Because we, with these kinds of technologies, we can't go forward with the mindset of conflict and division. There will inf- always be diversity and differences of opinion, but it doesn't have to go to the point of armed conflict and the kind of things that have happened in the last hundred years. So that's the big conscious choice we need to make. And that becomes the consciousness of peace and of oneness. And the experience of that in consciousness and higher states of consciousness becomes the foundation for safely bringing out these sciences and technology so that they can be used for the betterment of humanity. And I've had people say, oh, we'll never be evolved enough to handle this. I said, well, we better be because there's, we don't have another hundred years of burning fossil fuels and engaging in warfare with you know, various types of increasingly advanced weapons. There is a big change that we have to make, and uh, the sooner we make it, the better it will be for ourselves and our children and our grandchildren, and uh, that's what gets me up every day to keep doing this, uh, is, is the realization that uh, this is well within our reach. In other words, the thing that I find really beautiful about this is that everything we need to know and everything that we need to uh have in terms of science, technology, and even consciousness and understanding is on the planet right now. It needs to be organized and brought out. And that requires, it is a heavy lift because there are a lot of special interests, shall we say, who want to move things in the other direction of centralized global control, continuation of the petrodollar control system and macroeconomic slavery, Um, the people who want to keep people divided with a new enemy to fight want to present the us versus them scenario for ETs and humans. There are all these agendas that are operating which belong to the past yuga, the last, the, the Kali Yuga, the one that's closing. I call it the 452,000-year yuga that we need to get over. And, and I see that there's another era that's in the process of opening over the last 100 years or so, which is a, a half a million years of conscious evolution and really developed society that's not only peaceful but very high-tech, uh, but, but with the consciousness that these technologies are used for the common good and for peaceful purposes, and eventually the exploration of of space. And what I've always said is that with people, when they go out on these CE5 contact expeditions, if they go out there under the stars with a pure heart and an innocent frame of mind, uh, without prejudice and fear and negativity of this or that or the other ET group, they find that the universe opens up in mysterious and amazing ways very quickly, sometimes enigmatically, sometimes not in ways that you would expect, but these civilizations are waiting and watching and ready to welcome us, but there are certain criteria that need to be met. We can't go out there into this future with the consciousness of the nastiness and conflict and uh, division that has dominated the last hundred years. And so it's an evolutionary uh, process. It's both consciousness and thought 
and also technology, all that needs to come together. Uh, and the good news is that all that is known and here. We just need to uh, gather the momentum. And the wonderful thing is the more people who understand that and practice meditation and see this good future and visualize it and do things to help make it happen, it creates this stirring in this, what Rupert Sheldrake called the morphogenic field, that, like the hundredth monkey, where it non-locally propagates and, and manifests that good future. So this is really in our hands more than people realize. Everyone wants to look to the boogeyman and the so-called majestic group keeping this stuff secret. I said, you know what? It's what I said in the film series. Yeah, we're going to just leave the Pentagon and all those folks behind. Let's just create something better and new. And as Einstein said, no problem was solved with the consciousness that created it. We have to bring a new consciousness and understanding into this. And that's what we're trying to do at SeriousDisclosure.com and with the film series, but also with these research efforts and contact protocols. And, and the more that people join and do this together in a cooperative and positive way, the more it does change the course of our planet and our civilization in a, in a, a good direction. And I think people have to empower themselves with that knowledge that we really have more power individually and collectively than we give ourselves credit for. Uh, and we give too much power to interests that would want to stop us. It's not that they're not real. And I've certainly gone through the buzz saw uh, dozens and dozens and dozens of times um, with uh, the people who are detractors and attackers and stalkers and defamers and all kinds of nasty stuff. But that's really noise. The real issue is this vision that has to guide us as a people into a really beautiful future, a transformative future. And that's what we stay connected to. And, and if we stay connected to that um, and we work together to do it, it will come to pass. That's excellent. Um, so uh, how much uh, – are we almost out of time here? Or do we have uh, – Oh, yeah, we have another maybe five minutes. So, yeah, we can take some more uh, – One more question. Sure. Um, if you're um, on a CE5 expedition and practicing the CE5 protocols, once you make um, contact with um, an alleged uh, extraterrestrial, then what, what's the next step after that? Well, I think that the main thing is that if you're in a state of consciousness where there is both remote viewing and direct contact, that you stay in that state, uh, and it's really not about any particular agenda of a conversation. It's about coming together and being together, and that's the experience we've had at this phase. And so I think that if there's uh, – well, we have been on expeditions where people have physically been touched, where in Joshua Tree once, four ETs materialized physically over under some Joshua Trees that the group saw that were there and then dematerialized. So the main thing is to say stay peaceful and centered and convey your intent that you are an ambassador from humanity and earth to their people because what it's really about at this stage is building the communication and the contact and the relationship. And that can take place in many forms. I know one of the first nights we were out in uh, uh, Borrega Springs a couple years ago, there were there was a policeman and a fireman uh, from they were a married couple from New York City that and and, and she and her husband came and they just saw the earth. They did this with a, such an innocent, pure heart. And that night, there was a craft that was transdimensionally humming outside their room. And in their bedroom was an ET that was there for, I think, a couple of hours that they both saw and were in this state <coughs> excuse me, of communication and contact with in the most beautiful state of consciousness and communication. And the, what will be conveyed depends on the individual. If you're there with an entire team, the intent would be for everyone on that team to have contact with ambassadors from their civilization to you and to have that as a continuing process that goes on. And it does. People in the lucid dream state, in the meditative state, and physically around their house or in their yards will have this continue. And at this phase, what we're doing is wanting to build this relationship that is built on the concept of 
the oneness that exists in universal consciousness, that the mind itself is this infinite field that all of us can come together in. And it's the ultimate communication system, is mind itself. And uh, every point in space and time is actually com- connected through the awareness of every individual. So every person is a quantum hologram that's connected to everywhere in the cosmos. This is what's amazing about the nature of, of, of uh, conscious reality. And once you begin to experience that, and the ETs, uh, you have an, a, an experience with a craft or a, an individual ET, you, your intent is to continue that relationship that can take place in many, many forms, in many dimensions, and including physically um, sometimes. Not always, but it, it can evolve that way. And uh, how it evolves, I think, has a lot to do with the, the readiness and the preparation of the individual as well as what the ETs are interested in, in exploring with that individual. Um, my experience is that these civilizations are very eager to make these sort of personal contacts with people and in groups if folks are in the right intent. And the question of intent, why you're doing this, why are you there, becomes uh, determinative uh, and, and more important than any technical restraint. And so I always say to folks, you know, if you're there for the right reasons to make contact and be in a peaceful state. And, and, and when I've had these experiences, I actually put my hands out with my palms facing outward with my arms hanging beside my side and make sort of a triangular uh, vector with my two hands and my third eye, connecting with them and inviting them in a state of universal peace and and the oneness that we share as conscious beings because the mind and consciousness that's within us and the sentient conscious faculty that's within these ETs is the same single mind. And that knowledge and experience becomes then the gateway to very easy communication and a continuing and ongoing contact that can take place in many, many ways, whether it be physical 3D, lucid dream, astral, meditative thought, electronic, all the ways that we outline in, in, in the book, um, uh, contact countdown to transformation so uh, i think that's really what you want to do is it's it's more of a process within yourself and preparation and then seeing where it goes with any given et and and species and frequently when we've done this there'll be many different species together from different civilizations and i think that people uh, underestimate themselves and how easy it is actually to do this. And and the people who begin to practice this on any regular basis with a, a small group or even by themselves uh, begin to have amazingly beautiful experiences. Um, and they happen as you're ready for them to unfold. So there's really a lot of different ways to access this experience then, either through a group, um, a formal training with um, with your group, or um, which... Uh, which um, people can get to through etcontactnow.com or um, on their own using the app. There's an app. Uh, right. Or once you know the protocols and have some training, then you can form your own group or work with um, Costa Macreas' groups, uh, which there are, uh, I think, over a 1,000 groups now. Um, and uh, so there's, there's a lot of different ways to get at this material. Right, and I think that ultimately, even if it's yourself and a few people where you live doing this on some regular basis, it develops the skill of meditation, remote viewing, and contact. And we have found that the ETs always manifest in some way. Now, it may not be the mothership landing where you go on board and have bagels and locks. I mean, people have a very... I don't know, almost childish concept of, of the way interstellar civilizations would interact. They can do that, and that has happened, but that's the least likely way. The more likely way is, is, are the whole array of experiences that we've outlined, and, and I think if, it, it isn't – see, the, the what happens is less important than what state you're in that facilitates it happening. And that state is the meditative, deep state of oneness in, in consciousness, cosmic awareness. And 
civilizations that travel amongst the stars that go from one point to another, in order to do that, they are dropping out of 3D, 4D space-time, and they're going into other dimensions that are increasingly thought substance, astral. It's, it's, and their technologies are operating at that level, and then they reemerge into this dimension. But they may reemerge only partially, and it may be a sphere. It may be something that looks like a hologram. It may be an energy field. It may be a tone that's like a crystalline signal that's around you that conveys knowledge and information in a very abstract way. There are so many ways that these civilizations uh, do this. So I think we try to project the way that we would, you know, drive up in our car to someone and go and say hi and shake hands. But I think that when we're talking about civilizations that are transdimensional, because they're interstellar, by definition they're transdimensional. If you're going from one star system to another, you have to go faster than the speed of light. When you do that, you're in these other dimensions. And and I think at that point, uh, once you understand what I call the new cosmology, the understanding of this conscious quantum hologram that's aware and is multiple dimensions that include space and time and stars and galaxies, but include all these other types of fields of energy and thought forms uh, and Vedic tonality, for example. You begin to understand that the contact happens in a, a, a very diverse number of ways depending on where you are, what's around, who you are, and what everyone is ready to experience. And so preparing yourself uh, is the key thing, and practicing it makes it more and more perfect. And I, we have found that the groups that have been doing this for you know, a few, few years um, have just amazing experiences in the whole array of objects that are materialized, craft overhead, uh, beings that appear in, in the field in, in ways that are transdimensional or kind of like holographic conscious uh, beings, uh, like the picture of the, 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 this uh, E.T. Uh, at, at Joshua Tree, so many different ways. And I think that this, you know, getting back to where we started on this particular show, this is one of the reasons why I do want to do a uh, documentary and sort of a tutorial on this so that people get a sense of, what kinds of things might you experience and have we experienced and how do they appear? Because it's not just one simple answer and it has much more to do with the state of consciousness the person and the team is in than anything the ETs are about because they're going to, they can appear in a multiplicity of ways, all of which are fascinating and beautiful, but um, if you're not, if you don't know what you're looking at and you're not ready for it, you're going to miss it altogether. Um, so, that's part of the the educational process. That and and it's, it's an experience that's not limited to a few people. Everybody can develop a facility for it. I think if you're a conscious human being, you can do this. I mean, I, uh, I've always said that the, the birthright of every human is that they are conscious and they are able to create, um, have this experience and understand it. Uh, it, it's about learning and practicing the skill set of meditation and remote viewing and the other protocols, and it really isn't that difficult. But, you know, you do have to practice. It's like, you know, if you want to bench press 400 pounds, you don't go in there and do that the first day. So, you know, it, it's, a, it's a skill, um, and it's something you develop, and everyone can develop it. And uh, I've I found that there's no one... You know, if you approach this with the idea that you can do it with a pure heart and intent, you can do it, and it will happen. Um, if you think to yourself you can't do it, well, you won't do it. But that's like everything in life. So you have to have a certain amount of confidence and faith in yourself and in the, and, and in the reality that these civilizations are there, and they're really waiting for people to awaken uh, and do this together because certainly uh, they're not waiting on the State Department um, or the United Nations to do it. They're, they're, they're looking to us. They're looking to the people. So, well, I think we're out of time. I would That's like great. to thank you, Matt, for uh, organizing all this and then interacting with everyone on the Facebook page and, and uh, being part of this program today. It's been wonderful speaking with you. Yeah, and thanks so much uh, to you too, Dr. Greer. It's uh, been a very enlightening chat. 
All right. Well, thank you. And all of you at the World Puja Network, uh, thank you for hosting us here. And all of you listeners, keep looking up. And to find out more about what we're doing, you can go to uh, SeriousDisclosure.com. That's S-I-R-I-U-S, Disclosure.com. And until next time, uh, Godspeed. Bye-bye. Ours that we can all stay at together and, and have a really great meditative retreat experience. We're still getting the details of that worked out. But as soon as we have them, we'll let all of you know. And if you want to sign up for our uh, newsletter that comes out every week or so, you can go to SeriousDisclosure.com and just sign up, and it's free to do so. There's no membership charge or anything like that. So um, so anyway, so I know what we're planning to do today. Matt has been working with uh, the Facebook crowd and has a whole series of questions that are coming in frequently to that page. And uh, what he's going to do is sort of represent those who have had the questions and present them to me so we can have a discussion about what all of you have been asking about. So, Matt, do you want to begin with that? Okay, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, yesterday I put out there uh, uh, just, a, just a statement that Dr. Greer would like to talk about Sirius the Movie Facebook page and just does anybody have any questions. And we got quite an overwhelming response. Um, about 75 different questions. Oh, boy. Um, <laughs> we'll get through a few of them. Yeah, I think there's only time to deal with a couple of them. So, um, But one thing that seems to be on a lot of people's mind is uh, what, what do you think we should do, um, how do you think we should deal with if the governments create a false flag uh, operation or invasion, um, one that includes uh, violence and fear? Well, you know what's interesting when I'm asked that question, I, what I immediately go to, which shocks people, is that they've already done it. And hello, and welcome to Conversations with Dr. Stephen Greer. I'm Dr. Greer and founder of SeriousDisclosure.com and uh, the Disclosure Project. And I'd like to thank the folks at the World Puja Network for hosting us here every two weeks to bring you information and news about what we're doing on uh, the world of disclosure, uh, free energy, and contact with extraterrestrial intelligence. And really excited about what we're going to be talking about today. I have a a wonderful gentleman uh, here who has done so much work on the uh, Sirius Facebook page, which is Sirius the Movie, uh, on Facebook, and his name is Matt Humphrey. He's a, a volunteer who's been helping, who's done enormous amounts of work for us, uh, and for which I, we are very grateful. And uh, his interest in all this is to really to help clean up the planet and to make the world a better place for us to live, and uh, he sees disclosure as an important part of that. And he uh, has a background in marketing uh, and consulted in, in holistic and botanical medicines and health foods and environmental products and uh, music. And he's uh, really a pure-hearted, wonderful person who stepped up to the plate when we needed the help. And I think uh, you know we formed that uh, Facebook page, and now it has something like uh, 40 or 50,000 people following on it. So it's very good. So thank you very much, Matt Humphreys, and welcome to the show. Thank you, Dr. Greer, and uh, it's a pleasure to be on here with you. I know there's a, a pregnant pause there, but for about 50 years, the classified programs dealing with UFOs and extraterrestrial intelligence has been feeding into the public an enormous amount of disinformation that's tailor-made to create fear and uh, hatred. Of, of extraterrestrial civilizations. And this information has come out in a number of ways. The number one way is through the UFO subculture. The, number, the secondary way is through the Hollywood film industry and also through cable television series. So if you look at this subject and just step back, you'll see that about 80 to 90 percent of the material out there uh, is framed in a very dualistic way of us versus them, and there are good ETs and bad ETs, and they've invaded, and they're taking people and doing horrible things to them, and on and on and on and on. It turns out that that was a plan that was concocted back in the 50s 
uh, and this is a CIA document that I know we have a lot of material on our website, but it's uh, from 1953 where the CIA talks about uh, using the subject for, and I'm quoting from this document, psychological warfare value and purposes. Uh, then you, you find that there's a Strategic Studies Institute document from the 90s uh, that talks specifically about creating a global fear around the alien issue by using what's called stagecraft to stage certain abduction scenarios and other from half and uh, it's been very exciting to see uh, how much interest there is in uh, this film. So thank you all of you for your support. Uh, the other thing I want to, to say is that we're uh, putting up on our website um, a page that describes what we're doing for uh, funding the new energy research lab for STAR, a serious technology and research. Um, and that is going to have the budget and our goals and objectives and so you can go to SeriousDisclosure.com and see what kind of progress we're making with the fundraising and uh, what our plans are for a two-year period to do the research and development on the zero-point energy systems and other uh, innovative technologies that would get us off oil, gas, and coal. So that uh, is up on our site, and uh, we're very excited that uh, we'll be able to continue with that Campaign, and we're, we're hoping the public, and perhaps some larger investors as well, may come forward to to help us realize that dream because it's desperately needed. Um, I also just wanted to make a, a, a note that I know many people have been asking about our expedition to um, England to the crop circles in uh, late July and early August. That is um, full, and it's got a waiting list. So, unfortunately, uh, there, there's no more spaces on that. Uh, we will be having uh, or planning to put together a uh, expedition for the Close Encounters of the Fifth Kind initiative that will be in the western United States this fall. And we're still looking the way it looks like we may have found a really fantastic retreat center that's surrounded by national far Um And, uh, uh, well, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> yeah. So one of the things I wanted to do is bring people up to date with some, some news of what's happening. And uh, as um, many of you know, we're uh, just finally getting the uh, DVD master completed and it's at the manufacturing facility so in the next uh, week or two that's going to it's going to be manufactured and then begin to be shipped out so those of you who have uh patiently and we thank you uh been waiting for your DVD of the film Sirius uh that is going to be uh coming out very soon to all of you and uh everyone who uh contributed um, to the film uh, series during the crowdfunding effort, uh, who, had, who had given uh, a certain amount, will be getting a, a complimentary one. Those of you who want to order them can go to SeriousDisclosure.com, and you can both see the film there on video on demand, uh, and also you can order a copy of the DVD, uh, which will be available worldwide and begin shipping uh, within the next couple of weeks. So we're very excited that that's uh, being done, and it, it pretty much wraps up uh, the, the initial production of, of the film. And uh, we're uh, really grateful to everyone who's worked so hard on this to get it to this point, and all of you who, who contributed, because you know there's something like 4,000 people who have contributed to this film to make it the most successful crowdfunded documentary in history and it's just uh, going around the world now it's been out now for a little over a month or a month